Okay, today I wanted to make a video about high school physics and an application in the workplace. So you go to high school, you learn kinematics. Um, some of it may seem interesting, some people may think it's a little bit boring, but in either case, it's really nice to know where you can use some of this in the workplace. And you can use your high school physics in the workplace. So what I did is uh, I want to make a video on maybe some application of it. And remember, this is for high school, so it's not calculus-based. Um, I tried to stay away from the calculus aspects of it uh, for two reasons. One is um, some of the applications are very simple, and I wanted to get across. You really don't need to know calculus to make good use of this. If you know calculus, um, you know, it may make a little bit more sense. Um, there are some things you can do beyond what I'm going to show you, but without it, it's still very useful. So anyway, we'll get started here. The video has got a few sections. One, I'm going to go through some kind of uh, background derivations or kind of theory on the whiteboard here. Um, it may seem a little bit boring, a little bit dry. Then what we're going to do is take a, an actual data file from a real car on a real snow surface doing an ABS stop and we're going to show you uh, some uses of, um, of your physics and uh, how you can make it work for you. So hopefully you will enjoy this um, and not bore you too much. Maybe some of you might even be interested and think it's kind of cool. So here we go. Okay, so the first thing you learn at school is um, distance equals rate times time. I'm going to call that velocity times time. Well, really, this is better expressed if you just say the change or delta distance equals velocity times delta time. And normally, you start at x equals zero, so you don't have to really worry about the delta, and you start at time equals zero. But really, it's the distance that you changed is your velocity times the time um, period that you're talking about. So with that, you can kind of rearrange this term a little bit. You can say velocity is really the change in distance, or delta x over delta t, right? And that sort of makes sense because distance, if you measure in meters, then velocity can be in meters per second. So it's how much change in meters you had over the change in time. So your units are meters per second. So that sort of makes sense. Um, likewise, so a, a couple things here. If you have a plot with x in time, then if you want to know your velocity, you can just, between two points, you can draw them, right? And if you know the difference in x, so from here to here, that's your delta x, right? And here to here is delta t. Then you can figure out your velocity just by taking delta x divided by delta t, which is more commonly known as the slope here. So the slope of the x versus time plot is your velocity. And you can work that another way, too. Um, the other thing you can do with this equation is you can kind of go backwards, or go back up to here and say, if I want to know my change in x, if I know what my velocity is, and I know my change in time, I can figure out how far I've gone. So if I know a starting point, if, if x was 2, I find delta x, I just add that to it, and I find my new x location. So that's, that's pretty easy. And then we can kind of look at acceleration the same way, right? So acceleration, the units are usually in something like a change in velocity over time. So delta v over delta t, or more commonly you might want to say it's in meters per second. How much did I change the velocity in meters per second? divided by time, which is in seconds. So if you fix those units under one denominator, you're going to get meters 
per second squared, which you should have seen in your, your uh, phys physics class, right? So, um, same thing. Have a simple plot of velocity versus time. I'll just draw a straight line here again. You can apply the same principles, right? If you pick two points, you find your change in velocity right here. Delta V, this is delta T, right? Or the slope of that line segment, you get your acceleration. And then working it backwards again, you can go the other way and say, if I want to know how much my velocity has changed, if I know my acceleration, and I know the time difference, I can figure out how, how much my velocity changed. So if I was going 10 meters per second, and the acceleration is 2, and the time is, say, 2, that would mean I changed 4 meters per second, 2 times 2. My starting velocity was 10, so now I'm going 14 meters per second. So, just some simple concepts most of this is based on. Again, this is non-calculus based explanation. So, what we're going to do here is a couple simple graphical examples. Okay, so we're going to start with a simple example here, this graphical, which you um, undoubtedly have to do in one of your physics problems in high school. Constant acceleration is the easiest to handle mathematically right now, but you can use this approach for any type of uh, acceleration. But let's just say that we have something accelerating at a constant half meter per second here. So here's time axis, here's one meter per second, so this is A equals one half meter per second squared. So now what we want to do is figure out the velocity of this object versus time. So if you remember from before we said that um, delta V equals acceleration times delta T. So if you think about that that's really just the area here because your acceleration is constant. So if you look at this little area between 0 and 1 second I can say how much did my velocity change over that period of time. Well, so if I started a rest here, which is zero, how much did my velocity change over a period of time, one second? So if a is a half, one second, then that means my velocity, delta v, equals just one half times one equals one half obviously, so if I change by half, I started at zero, I went up to one half. So here's my first data point. I want to do the same thing again. This is easy because it's constant acceleration, so what is this area? It's one half times one again. No big deal. So my velocity went up by half. Here's my next point. So you can see this one's very easy. I can just keep repeating. My velocity goes up a half every time. So I end up over here. Here's my little line segments, right? So that's pretty easy. So you basically used this relation. You took the area under the acceleration versus time curve. You add that increment to your velocity. You keep figuring out your new one in every step. So now we'll go one more step and we'll say that. So now we're going to apply the same principle again, but now we're going to say that delta x equals v times delta t. So we did that um, a couple minutes ago. So basically if we know the velocity and we know the difference in time, we know how much x changed. So we'll apply that same principle and we'll figure out the displacement or the position of the object that's accelerating half a meter per second, starts at rest, starts at position zero. So here we go, we're starting at zero, right? So we're going to say delta x equals v times delta t. So really what we're going to do here is take the area again. 
So what is the area here? It's a triangle, right? Right triangle. So area equals one half. I'll call it altitude, which is one half times the base, which is one second. So if you multiply that all out, you get one quarter. And of course, the units on this should make sense because the velocity is in uh, meters per second, right? And I'm going to multiply that by time, which is in seconds, and I get meters. So the seconds cancel out. And that's what we want. We want x. So what we found here is in this first little bit, we went a quarter meter further than we started. So basically a quarter meter is about right here on my scale. And we're going to do the same thing again. Now the area of this place I'll break into two. So I've got the same triangle again, right? It's, it's one half, one. So I don't have to keep redoing that. Each one of these is a, is a quarter, right? So I've got that. Now I've got this new area here, which I'll uh, draw like this. The new area is one unit. And since this was at a half, it's a half. So if I add those two together, I get one quarter plus one half equals obviously three quarters. So what that says is the change in distance increased by three quarters from where it was. So if I was at a quarter and I went up three quarters, now I'm at one. So I keep doing this. I go all the way across. Here's another quarter, right? Now this time I'm up at one times one. So my area is one and a quarter. So now I'm going to I said my change in x went up by one and one quarter from where it was. So if I was at one, I went at one and one quarter. Now I'm at two and a quarter, which is about here. All right. So I took care of this whole area. Going to do it one more time. Same thing. This little triangle is a quarter, but now I'm at one and a half. So it's one and a half times one. So it's a quarter plus three halves. Right, which is one and three quarters, right? One and a half plus a quarter. So if I was at two and a quarter and I go up one and three quarters, it's going to get me all the way to uh, four, right? So I go over here and find four. So now you can see what the velocity is going to look like. And truth be said, this is a parabola. I'll try to draw it the best I can. Not very good, but it keeps getting steeper and steeper. So that's the x versus time. Now, the other thing you can do is work this backwards. So going in the other direction, if we want to know what the velocity is here at, at 2, we want to try to figure the slope of that out. But you can see this is a curve, right? So you can't really just take these two points because the slope would kind of be an average. If you, take, if you go from here to here, the slope of this is kind of the average in between, so that's not very good. It might be better if you just want to approximate this is go, if I want the slope here, how about if I connect these two points, right? Or if you can do it graphically, you can get closer and closer. But if I approximate that, um, this point we said was one quarter, right? And this point we said was two and one quarter. So if I want to know the um, slope, it's rise over run, right? Right triangle. So the rise is two and a quarter minus a quarter, that's two. And the run is two. So the slope equals two divided by two, one. And that would be meters per second because you have two meters divided by two seconds one meter per second. And if you kind of go back here and say, what was the velocity here? Guess what? It was one meter per second. So the only reason for this is to try to, uh, to go through here and show you where the equations come from. This is kind of the boring part. One other thing we can take a look at, basically with your physics book, you're going to have a couple equations. Um, one is going to be this 
v equals v0 plus acceleration times time. So if you really think about that, all that means is my new velocity is going to be where I started times acceleration times time. Well, over here, we took the acceleration multiplied by time, we had the area. So this part comes from this area here. The original V is just where you started because you remember you have to add those increments on, no big deal. Okay, let's take um, one little step aside here. Um, just a quick math relationship here. If you're find, trying to find the area of a trapezoid like this, and I'm going to use some, uh, well, it doesn't matter, I'll use uh, A, B, and I'll use T here. So the area of this is, uh, of course, A times T, right, for this part. And then this part is uh, one half. The difference in here is uh, B minus A. And the base is T. So now we need to add those together, right? So let's start with that. Let's say the area equals AT plus one half B minus A times t. Now we should be able to simplify this. So I'm going to do some term rearrangement here. I'm going to say area equals t times, I'm going to kind of skip a step here, but I'm going to say that instead of a, I'm going to go 2a over 2. And of course this is 1 half bt, so I'm going to say plus b over 2. The t's out here. And over here I'm going to say minus a over 2. So this becomes that. So now this is interesting because you can say A equals T times, i have got a 2A minus a 1A, so that's A plus B over 2. So the reason I say that, rather than worry about how you got here, if you're trying to find the area of a trapezoid, you can just add the two sides up, A and B, divide by 2 and multiply by the base. So really it's the average between this value and this value, A plus B divided by 2, it's average times the width delta T. So keep that in mind, it'll be um, used in the next step here. So let's figure out where this came from. So what we're going to need is um, we're trying to find the area of the trapezoid, right? So x equals where it started plus the area of this trapezoid. Well, the one side is going to be your velocity. You know, if you're trying to find the area of a little trapezoid here, it's going to be the velocity where you started, so that's going to be v0. And from before, we're going to do the average of the two sides. Well, the other side is v0 plus the at, right? And that actually, yeah, so that's that. And we need the average, so we're going to multiply by half. And then the base was the t. So now if you do this, you get x equals x0 plus, um, you're going to get one half v0 t plus another one half v0 t plus one half a t squared. Well, half v0 t and half v0 t are equal. You fold v0 t, so you get x equals x0 plus v0 t plus one half a t squared. Now, keep in mind, as I said in the beginning, this is non-calculus based. If you do this with calculus, there's a whole other way with integrals and derivatives where this makes sense. But for somebody in 11th grade physics that doesn't know calculus yet, this is how you can explain it. So we're going to use these principles now to do some real work.
Okay, so here's the real application we're going to take a look at. I've got a vehicle stopping in snow with ABS and there's two different um, control schemes for the ABS that I'm looking at. Uh, I have data, but I don't have a measurement of the distance and the acceleration is not constant because if you take a look at plots which we'll take a look at in a little bit versus time if you look at A which is in meters per second squared or G's which is just meters per second squared divided by 9.8 meters per second squared so I've got acceleration data and this is zero what it's what it would ideally maybe look like is a waveform that's kind of uniform like this. Maybe it's easier to deal with, but in reality, you've got wheels that are not locking but slowing down, speeding up. There's four of them on the car. Snow is bumpy. So what you see is you see data that's very noisy like this. I've got an acceleration trace. So I've got this for both cars. I don't have anything to measure distance. Um, there are GPS devices. It's not like you're going to take a tape measure out there in the snow. And uh, I've got some maybe estimate of velocity, which is another, uh, another way to do it. But what I can do from our last lesson is if I integrate or do kind of the area under the curve of the, um, the velocity trace. Um, so what I'm going to do here is, in reality, what we're going to do is chop this into a bunch of little areas, right? And since these are, this is negative, this is positive, those areas are going to be negative. So what it will do is it will subtract from the velocity because if you can remember, you had V equals V0 plus AT, right? Well, this is negative, velocity is going to slow down, which makes sense. I'm going so many meters per second. I decel, my velocity slows down. So what we're going to do is we'll show you a method in Excel where we can take real data and we can estimate how the velocity looks versus time. So we'll erase this just for a second. So what we're going to have here is, I'll draw it small, we'll have our acceleration trace that looks like this. We'll have a velocity trace, the car is coming along, and now all of a sudden I'm going to start subtracting. The velocity in general is going to slow down when the car stops. Well, the distance is going to go something like something like this. So if you think about that, if that's x and this is time, I'm going slower and slower, so the change in distance as time goes on gets less and less. So the first part of the stop cover a lot of distance for a given period of time where over here that same period of time or to draw that I get a smaller difference in X. But anyway so what we can do is use the same technique I'll show you how. We'll take the velocity we're starting with and we'll subtract off these little areas and we can estimate the velocity versus time and then what we'll do is do the same thing. We'll take a whole bunch of little areas here and we'll, since the car is going forward, it's going further, we take that delta, that area and add it to the x and get an estimate of what the x is. Now if I have two of these and one of them maybe, maybe looks a little different, maybe it looks like this, I can now try to figure out which one's better because it's pretty hard. They look kind of the same Acceleration's jumping around, but it's very difficult for me just to look at it and say one is definitely better than the other. So I'll use this technique to take two acceleration curves and estimate the time it took or the distance it took this vehicle to stop without actually measuring the distance. Um, the advantage of this, you could say, well, go out and get something to measure distance. Could do that. Um, something like that is expensive. Um, I do have access to it. This data is already run. I don't want to have to go back and repeat the test. I can use the data I have and a little bit of high school physics to figure this out. 
So what we're going to do is transition this discussion to a computer screen. And we'll go from there. Now one thing that I want to remind you of is that the area of a trapezoid, which is what our data is going to look like, we're going to have some curve like this and we're going to chop it into little pieces. Maybe this time though, instead of being one whole second, will be maybe a hundredth of a second. So our approximation is very good because in this case, if this were a whole second and we were doing this, the velocity or the uh, acceleration changed in there wouldn't be very accurate. But if I'm taking very small time slices, then there's not much change between the points, just a little bit. And I can treat that as a trapezoid again. So going back, if I treat this as a trapezoid, I take the acceleration on this side, I'll call it A0 on this, A1. If I add those two, A0 plus A1 divide it by 2, multiply it by my time, I have the area of this trapezoid. Now if I add that to the prior velocity, I'll get the new velocity. And remember in our case, the accelerations are negative, so this is going to subtract from the velocity and slow the car down, which is what you're doing when you're stopping. So this is a real world example, it's something I'm doing for work, and it's basically high school physics. This is where you use it if you're an engineer. So here we go. It is a data trace for an actual vehicle. So a um, couple of the signals here. This orange one in the screen is deceleration. So you can see the car's on snow and the speed is slowing down just while coasting because you know it takes uh, a force to keep it going the same speed through the snow. So if you coast, you'll naturally slow down a little bit. And then the brakes are applied right here. So this orange signal is the deceleration or acceleration. Um, this is slightly negative because the car is slowing down. Then the brakes are pressed really hard. ABS is active. So you can see what I was talking about. The acceleration signal jumps around quite a bit. This is reality that you'll deal with. So in the physics book it might look nice and smooth, but this is really what's happening. This is the signal that you get to deal with. This red signal is a wheel speed in ABS in the snow. So the wheels are coming along at a certain velocity here. And in meters per second, it's about 15. So 15 meters per second is roughly about 30 miles an hour. Then the brakes are applied. And you can see how the wheels start to go into a lot of slip and they're heading towards zero velocity and then they speed up a little bit and they go down they speed up back and forth this is basically what ABS does um, it means anti-lock braking system a locked wheel means it's at zero so it lets the wheel slip which is good for stopping you actually need it to slip a little bit which is another explanation but it keeps it from going all the way to lock, which is not good because it's very difficult to uh, make your car go in the direction you want to go if all the wheels are locked. So this is a wheel and what perhaps ABS control looks like on this vehicle, particular tire in the snow. If we want to add another wheel in, that was a uh, one of the fronts. The other one looks like this. So you can see the two wheels are independently controlled to a certain extent and the wheel speed goes up and down. Now this other this other uh, line on the screen here there's a gray one that is an estimate of the vehicle's velocity so what's taking place here is through some logic and mathematics someone has taken the wheel speeds which are varying quite a bit to try to figure out or deduce from those wheel speeds how fast the vehicle is going, which is um, sometimes a difficult matter, but you can see uh, you can see this gray line that's going down through the screen here. That's an estimate. So what I want to do here is I want to take this orange signal, which is very noisy, and I want to double integrate it or find the area between zero, which is up here, and the actual data points and subtract that from the that results from that or the velocity data that results from that and estimate 
how far the vehicle's gone. So now if I have two data plots like this with perhaps some differences in the ABS control, I can make an assessment on which one actually stopped the car faster. And you can see that just by looking at data like this, it could be very difficult to estimate this because there's, uh, there's a lot of variation in the data. So we'll tackle that next. All right, so what I've done here, I took that data file, the orange line, and I exported it. So basically what I have here is the time this started was at um, 48 seconds. So the data recorder had been running. The brakes were applied right here at 48.58 seconds. So you can see here that the time increment is only one millisecond or one one hundredth of a second. So I've got a bunch of data. Um, I had to assume some initial conditions. So this is when the brakes were applied at 48.58 seconds. Um, I just said the acceleration was zero at that point. It really was minus 0.05. It doesn't matter for this uh, analysis. I had to insert or enter my initial velocity here which was 15.171 meters per second which is really about uh, I'm going to call this x equals zero so that's where I want to start the measurement so basically what I did here this is the data that I was able to use from the data file so I've got a timestamp and a data point from that orange curve so you can see at first it's not decelling very fast and then it picks up. Now keep in mind here, these numbers are in G's. So what that means, if you want it meters per second, you have to multiply by 9.81. So a minus 0.22 means I'm really decelerating at um, right around, I don't know, 2.2 meters per second squared or negative. So anyway, I've, I've um, factored that into my um, calculations and if you go all the way down to the bottom here I stopped doing the analysis of 55 seconds okay and you can see the D cell was uh, you know minus 0.25 which is about 2.5 meters per second you can see at the end of the stop we got a little bit more D cell and then the car starts to rock a little bit at the end of the stop like they do and I stopped it when it was minus 0.01 which is a very small deceleration. Okay, so now let's figure out what I did with this. So let's let's take a look at this. So the first thing I need to do is figure out at each one of these lines what the velocity was. So if my data file says, and I want to go ahead and fix this because it keeps popping up, it wasn't 60 miles an hour. This is about 30. Just for the heck of it. Okay, so I type that in. So I want to know what the velocity is in the next step if I decelerated at minus 0.05 g's from 48.58 seconds to 48.59 seconds. So what I did here is I said my new speed is going to be where I started, which is cell C6, right? And then I had to find the area. So remember the area, uh, you take the two sides of the trapezoid. So you take the two data points and um, one was uh, zero. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and change this. I can do this on the fly. Let's just assume it was accelerating the same amount at, at the initial start here. doesn't really matter because 0.05 is a small number, but I'll, I'll go uh, minus 0.05. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take minus 0 0.05, minus 0 0.05, those are the two legs. I'm going to add them, divide by two, and get the average, and multiply it by the, the width, which is 0.01 seconds. So you kind of see that in the formula here. You have the old velocity, 15.171 in cell C6. I'm going to take B7 and B6, which are here and here. I'm going to add those up. The divide by two I put out here at the end. It's not a big deal because, as you know, it doesn't matter the order of operations for multiplication and division. And then I multiplied by the, the width, which is A7 minus A6, so you get 0.01 seconds. 
So here's my trapezoid. Now remember, since these were in G's, not meters per second squared, I had to multiply by the acceleration due to gravity to get it back to meters per second. The velocity, or yeah, the velocity was, um, well actually get it back to meters per second squared. The velocity was already in meters per second. So what you see here, when you do the math, it subtracts a little bit off the velocity, the car slows down. And then you just copy this formula down. So next time, the starting velocity is in C7. You add the two legs, which are in B7 and B8 right here. You multiply it by A7 minus A8, which is your time step, and divide by 2. And you keep doing this all the way down the page. You can see the velocity of this vehicle is starting to slow down when the brakes are applied. Now, what I did, you do that one more time to find the distance. Okay, so where were we here? Um, what I wanted to do is basically, now that I know or I have an estimate of the velocity based on finding the area under the curve for each little slice of acceleration, what I can do is do the same thing for the distance. So, we'll look at the formula again. So what I'm going to do is say, the distance here is the old distance, which is in D6, this cell right here. And I'm going to take the area of the trapezoid. So I've got C6 and C7, right? Those are my velocities. They're the two legs of the trapezoid. I'm going to divide that by 2 or multiply by a half right here. And I'm going to multiply the width, which is A7 minus A6, which is the timestamp. And I just copy this formula all the way down the page. All right. So now what I've done is for every timestamp of data that I had from my data file, I've been able to compute a velocity estimate and a distance estimate. So basically you can see this car stopping. It goes all the way down the page. You can see the distance is in increasing in the screen data. And the... Uh, the velocity is decreasing, which makes sense. We're trying to stop the car. It's slowing down and it's scooting along, accumulating distance. So this is on going three or four meters per second. And I'm just kind of scrolling through the data here. So I get down to the bottom. Now what happens when a car stops, sometimes it kind of rocks around a little bit. So the actual stop probably takes place right around here at, at uh, rocking around you really don't change much. So it's 54.992, 54.947, not a big difference. So basically this car stopped at about 54.9 meters. And that particular um, you know, data trace. So we can do this again and now we can compare stops when we never had distance. We can make an estimate of which one actually stopped shorter by using this technique. So this is, uh, this is a real application of basically what I call high school physics and maybe where you could apply it at work instead of, um, you know, all the things you see that are just constant velocity, very simple problems that you think you're never going to encounter in real life. This is a real life job application. So um, hopefully when you're taking your high school physics class, uh, you can see ahead where you might actually use this and maybe you'll pay attention a little bit more. Hopefully you find this interesting. I do. Not everybody will, but uh, that's up to you and your personal preferences. Thank you for watching. Before I ended the, the video that I kind of forgot, looking at columns and numbers is a little bit boring. So what I wanted to do is, is take what we had and replot it. So basically, the purple line is um, the acceleration data that um, I had exported and used. Uh, the red line here is just the velocity. You remember it started about 15.7 meters per second, came down to zero. Um, and then the green line here is the distance. So this ended up at, you know, as we said, around 54.9 meters. So basically sometimes it's nice to plot this stuff, but really all I wanted to know is what the stopping distance was. But just wanted to show you uh, something else you could do with Excel here, which is pretty easy. Now... Excel can handle a couple time scales, but uh, what I did here to make it easier to look at is I multiplied the accelerations by 100. So, you know, if it says 0.2 here, it's really 0.02.
um, or point to see some application of some of the things you learn in physics here and what you might do with them at work. Thank you for watching. Okay, so I wanted to um, circle back here and kind of complete the analysis because when we first started out I said I was going to use it to compare to uh, two different vehicle stops, maybe using a little bit different control scheme. So one point I'd like to make this may not be the best thing to measure absolute di distance. Use it to estimate, or estimate as I said, but um, <clears throat> it may not be super accurate if you really want the real distance. But what it can be good for is comparing two things. So what I've got here is another data file that did the same analysis was this, and you can kind of see the deceleration profile. So just kind of take a look at that. and. Um, Look at it with respect to these lines on the screen because the further below that means the more decel you're pulling and the less jumping around or noisy it looks perhaps um, the better for uh, overall stopping distance and control. So let's go back and look at this one. You can see that at times it's not decelerating as much and it seems like the decel is jumping around a little bit more. So let's uh, flip over to Excel and uh, see what that means in terms of our analysis. So it doesn't really look as good, but let's see if we can prove it. Okay, so you remember I had two files, the first part of the video we analyzed one and we came up with a uh, stopping distance of 54.92. So I went back and I uh, got another data file that I wanted to compare that I personally didn't think would be as good, but I wanted a little bit of data to really quantify what kind of difference there was. So when you go back and look at the second data file using the same technique I get 61 meters. So what you're talking about is maybe five or six meters here which is uh, you know roughly around 20 feet. So the first control scheme seems to be stopping about 20 feet shorter than the second. This was the same vehicle, same day, um, you know, same tires, etc. The one thing to, to realize is that in general stopping distances on cars, especially in snow, can vary day to day because some snow is, is colder, it's slipperier, it's wetter, so on and so forth. So it's very important if you're going to do a comparison to, um, to try to do it in controlled conditions. There is, you know, very small window of time, um, same snow conditions, same snow field. You want to be as uh, you know repeatable as possible and then there's still going to be some variation. But I think here when we see this much we can draw a conclusion that the first uh, vehicle condition was much better for stopping in the snow. So anyway this concludes it, uh, concludes the video. High school physics at work in the workplace. Thank you.